Hi everyone, today I'm going to show you how you can take advantage of Xgrape for SQL Server so that you can write SQL queries against the Splunk REST API. And what I'm really trying to show you is how Xgrape lets you turn any web API into a SQL consumable data source. And Splunk just happens to be a good example since you can unlock your operational analytics data to use in the SQL world with almost ridiculous ease using Xgrape. So to prove that point, I'm going to start this demo as I did the last one with a perfectly clean slate and I'm going to create a brand new database. And one of the first steps that we need to do is enable Xscrape access within this database. And we have an easy way to do that. If you go to the Xscrape.com website, under Products, Xscrape for SQL Server Tools, we've exposed the Script Generator tool, and you can run that directly from the website. And so the first thing we're going to do, as I mentioned, is enable our new database. We have a template for that. So we're going to pick the Enable Xscrape for Database template, click on Create Script, and it's created a script for us that's going to change a couple of database settings and create some objects. So I'm going to actually execute this directly into the database, and now we're ready to go. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a schema just specifically for Splunk objects that we're going to create during this demo. And now we're ready to start talking about Splunk. So Splunk lets you create searches against uh, data that you've collected. If I take a look, I've got a Splunk instance that I'm running here, and I'm collecting some event log data uh, from my local machine. And so we can run searches here in the UI, but we can also run them through the REST API. And so in order to do that, there's a few steps that are involved. So I'm going to walk you through those steps right now. So uh, the first thing that we can do here is create a session key. And we're going to do that using hosted web get single, which is an Xscrape function, uh, and we're going to call Splunk. And I've got a, uh, I've, I've exposed my machine. I'm going to use the, the IP address of my machine here. And I've got a username and password that I've set up. And so Splunk lets you log in. Uh, using this uh, reference and we're also going to post our username and password uh, and the ability to post like this is something that Xscrape allows us to do uh, using the xs.ql language because obviously this on its own isn't a normal URL you can think of it as kind of an, ex an enhanced URL that has uh, additional information that helps Xscrape figure out how to actually get what you're after um, that's only part of the part of it though we also want to get specifically the session key and what's going to get returned from this is a little bit more than 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 just the session key so let's take a look at that if we want to see what comes back from this uh, particular uh, rest call uh, we've got a couple couple ways to do that um, and and one way that we can do now is to actually use a uh, page explorer so if you again go to the website and, and under products xscrape page explorer We've exposed this tool as well. This tool was previously only available when you installed SQL Hero. Now you can run it directly from the website. So if I run the tool, we've got a example of the URL that uh, we, we had in Management Studio. I've substituted in the specific uh, username and password here. And if we say load, we can see this is what would come back from our request from Splunk. Now, this is what we really want. This is the, the actual session key. And so if I take that session key and I say, well, let's search for that, we can see that Page Explorer has given us a few suggestions about how we might want to get that session key. And so we can say, for example, first element equals session key is kind of the simple way to do it. Um, it also gives us a full XPath uh, expression as well. And so Page Explorer is here to try and help us. It's intended to make your life easier so you don't have to become a rocket scientist in regular expressions or XPath. But of course, it doesn't hurt to be that either. Um, but it doesn't cover every base either. It, it offers ideas on how to identify both uh, discrete values and entire tables of interest. Um, so, you know, we can do the searches on, on text that we know 
uh, we're interested in and then ha have that help us identify uh, terms that we can use that can then be used within our actual uh, Xscape function calls like this one, hosted web gets single. So if I actually save this function and I run it, we can see we actually got back the same session key that was presented here when we, we looked it up using Page Explorer. All right, so that's an example of getting a scalar value using a user-defined function that wraps an Xscrape call. So the next thing we're going to do is create an actual search job in Splunk. And so that involves passing in the session key that we previously uh, obtained. And we're also going to pass in an actual search query expression. And you can see that Splunk has its own search language, essentially. Uh, and that's available to you in the UI. And you can also use it here in, in the uh, REST API as well. So in this case, uh, the create search job function is going to return uh, what amounts to a job ID. It's called a, 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 a SID. And so it's very similar to what we did with the uh, get session key. We're calling a different REST service. We're actually passing in uh, a custom header, uh, which we're able to do using Xscrape as well, the, the enhanced URLs. And we're also posting our uh, search query uh, as one of our parameters here. And we're getting back the SID in a similar kind of way that we got the session key back. So if I just run this test, we can see that it's returning me this, this uh, SID that we would then be able to use in subsequent steps. So the act of creating this job in Splunk is basically started it, started it asynchronously and it'll run for a certain amount of time and then complete. So we, we can't just go and grab results right away while it's running. So one of the functions that I've created here is, uh, is job complete? And we can pass in the SID and get a status back, a true or false status on whether the job is actually finished running or not. And we can see that uh, in this case, I actually am using XPath to go into the document. The document's a little more sophisticated than, you know, just getting the session key was, you know, where it was just, you know, two simple elements. This one's a little more involved, so I'm going after a specific element. Uh, it, it, the element is called key, and it has an attribute called is done. Uh, so, you know, rather than messing around with like regular expressions, they're going straight after the actual element. So now we can do something like this. So I'm going to run, kind of put it together a little bit. I'm actually going to create the search job. I'm going to wait for it to complete in a loop. And at the end, I'm going to call uh, hosted web get table. And I'm going to pass in the SID that we had previously. And I'm expecting to get results out of that. And my output mode is, is CSV in this case. Uh, so in this case here, we're, we're getting raw results. I didn't create a wrapper for this yet. And so we're getting the raw row number, column number, value combinations that the web get table will return you. And that's okay. That's perfectly fi fine. You can use that approach if you want to. Uh, I prefer to use wrapper uh, views or UDFs. Um, that gives you the ability to have, you know, stronger typing. And it'll give you kind of real, you know, reasonable column names that correspond with what the data source looks like. Um, so uh, we can create a, a wrapper fairly easily off of this uh, using the um, script generator. And I, I did this as well in the previous uh, example, previous demo video. Uh, I'll do it again here, just just to show you how easy it is. So if I take this expression and I go to script generator and I say create view from URL and I'm just going to call it, I'm not actually going to save this so I'm not, it doesn't really matter what I call it. And we need our client access key. And if we go just simply with this, it's gone out and it's figured out rather than row number, column numbers, I can give you a view that has columns such as, you know, index time and raw and 
source and source type and so on. So we could take this, save it in the database, tweak it up however we like, and we're further along to having this, as I said, str kind of strongly typed wrapper that's very, very handy to use. So I'm going to just, I've already done this previously, it's part of my script, so I'm just going to commit it here. So now we've got a lot of pieces, and so now I'm going to create one kind of final piece that puts it all together. I'm going to create a store procedure, which goes ahead and creates our search job. We pass in our search. In this case, it's doing a search over pretty much everything I've got and taking the top 40 rows. Uh, it's waiting for the job to complete, and it's doing a select out of our uh, view wrapper and returning the, the results uh, in a result set. So if I run that, it's going to take a few seconds here. Um, the fact that we're returning 40 rows versus 4 million rows is important. It's good to have Splunk do what Splunk does best, which is process you know, large amounts of data. And so if we want to do aggregation and kind of pre-processing uh, before we return the data to SQL Server, that's always a good thing. So in this case, we've got, as you can see, 40 rows back, as we would expect. And it looks pretty much like a table. Um, it, it's, it's giving us exactly the, the format that um, Splunk made available to us. All right. So another way we can do this whole process is we can kind of skip the job creation and actually go ahead and use this uh, jobs export service that's part of the API and so it's very similar conceptually uh, we can pat we have to pass in our username and password and we pass in our, our search expression uh, as post variables um, I'm gonna do this one a little bit differently I'm gonna actually use XML as the output format uh, from the service which is the default because I haven't provided a uh, output mode on, on this and so if we do that, uh, we're going to get something that looks quite a bit different. Um, and if I take a look at how that looks in raw form, this is the kind of format that comes back in the XML from Splunk. And so we can see that we've got results come back per row uh, in these result elements. And so there's multiple result elements that come back within a uh, results kind of root element. And so we can go ahead and manually tweak up how we want to grab data out of an XML document like this. So, for example, I can say rows path, and I can say we, we want to root our rows um, at the uh, result node within results. So for every result element, we're going to treat that like a row, essentially. And then within that, we can define columns. And the thing about the XML document here is it's, it's a little bit inconsistent in some cases we got to go you know field value text um, in this one it's field V for example uh, so we we have an opportunity here uh, where if Xscrape isn't able to use its its magic in terms of its inference engine to figure out what we want we can tell it what we want very explicitly um, and so if I run this this is actually for 4,000 rows so this is going to go out and, and it's going to give us the data that we pretty much had before, but we're doing a subset. We're only looking at four different rows uh, or four different columns in this case uh, that we've explicitly identified. And you can see that we've got 16,000 rows returned, which makes sense. We've got 4,000 rows times four columns. So we've got 16,000 rows that came back from a uh, web get table here. So, I'm going to create a, a wrapper as well. I previously did it. I went through Script Generator. You can do it as well. Um, I'll just save time by creating it here. You can see that the, uh, the the function call is pretty much exactly the same. So now I'm going to call. I'm going to I'm going to use the view we created, and I'm going to throw in one wrinkle here. I'm going to add an extra uh, column in the result set, and I'm calling this extract value with XSQL. And that's a, a function that we've provided in our uh, CLR library that gets installed with Xscrape into your database. And you're free to use it. You can use it for 
uh, things that are completely non xscape related if you want. We have uh, functionality here, for example, that's going in and taking our raw uh, event log entry, which has got a lot of text in it, and we're actually pulling out the message text. So, for example, if we go back to our uh, XML document here, we're looking for basically this line, and then we're looking for this text right here that I've highlighted, right? So we can actually pull that out uh, as part of this SQL query, right? So it's a freebie. You can use it, and it's using the same functionality that you get when you see this particular uh, uh, argument in Xscrape. So whenever we're doing these value extractions, that's the same. That's the same syntax that you can actually use down here uh, in your call to extract value with SQL. All right. So uh, essentially, the, what we did here is we were using uh, the XML format, and, and we got what we wanted. Um, now, now, interestingly enough. Uh, if we switch over to use JSON instead, so to do that it's pretty simple. I just change the output mode to JSON here, and other than that, I didn't change anything else. I'm still calling jobs export. I'm still passing in the username and password. I'm still posting the same search parameters, um, but you'll notice I'm not passing anything else in. I'm passing in nothing related to expressing the shape of the uh, result that we're interested in. Uh, at this at this level, when we're using JSON, it turns out that the Xscrape inference engine kicks in again and does a very good job of figuring out what we probably want out of the underlying data. So I basically went in and created a view wrapper using just this as my input to the script generator for the view wrapper, and I got back this select statement okay so it knew about these columns like the source and the raw and the index time and so on uh, and I didn't have to do anything I just passed in the extended URL and if I run this it's basically the same kind of thing as I had with the uh, XML example but I'm just using a subset of the columns, because I have more columns available to me now, I've aliased them, and other than that, I'm, I'm getting the same kinds of results, uh, you know, from that. So, what have we learned out of this process? So, you know, first, Xscrape continues to improve and address increasingly complex use cases. Uh, you know, this, this was a good example to drive out some functionality, and we'll drive out more as time goes on. Um, and second, we're able to, to make a tool like Splunk all the more accessible to, to wider audiences. You know, some may wonder if it's a good idea to kind of you know, go, go there by making it uh, possible to write SQL against it. And, and there are caveats, I would say. So you know, first, I'd avoid returning 100 million rows to SQL and you know, processing it from there, um, kind of as I mentioned before. You know, it's, you know, instead, if you can make Splunk do what Splunk does well and, and handle big data and perform aggregations and analysis, uh, using the Splunk search engine, and then having the process data stream back to a tool like SQL Server, you know that's not crazy at all. You know, after all, you know they, they expose their API for a reason uh, to make their data accessible in all sorts of products and places. Um, you know, as a practical example, Xscrate makes it feasible to say get back some aggregated operational data to include in a reporting services report that you might otherwise have been thinking about writing code for to extract the data from Splunk and then import it to SQL Server. Well. Now you've essentially eliminated not one but two steps by simply making the desired data accessible using Xscrape, as if it were a local table that just happens to be as live as your source data is. And another key thing to mention yet again is that our use of Splunk is largely illustrative here. You know, we can do this with almost anything that has a web API, which is a whole lot in today's world. And if you run into some hard case that you're, you're having trouble solving, let us know. We, you know, we'd be interested and extending Xscrape to support more and more of those types of use cases. And we're going to be publishing the T-SQL script from our example today on xscrape.com uh, shortly, along with a blog article that clever, covers a lot of what we talked about here. And if you're not already on the mailing list for updates, please sign up. It's free, and as you can tell, this definitely has some legs to it, and you'll want to stay tuned. So thanks for watching, guys.